Hello and welcome to the program Meet Professionals with me, IBKB. Well, Meet Professionals is a platform where I hold one-on-one -on -one level conversations with entrepreneurs, academics, leaders, policymakers, and many more. For our very first edition today, we're joined by a nice specialist practicing in the UK, Dr. Mohamed Lamin Darami. So welcome to the program. Thank you, Ibrahim. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. Have a seat. Um, so welcome to the program again, Dr. Dagami. Thank you, and it's my pleasure. We and I have a lot to talk about in a very small time. So um, I'd like to kick in where you help us talk about your background, um, where you started from, to where you are now as an ophthalmologist. Well, I was born into a Muslim family, and. Uh, went to primary school in Sierra Leone, then secondary school in Bo and McBroker. I went to CKC up to Form 5, then I attended McBroker Boys Secondary School where I did my A-levels. Okay. From my A-levels, I won a Manor Union Scholarship, studied medicine in Liberia. Okay. Finished medical school in 1986. Wow, that's and a long time ago. Yes, I worked there for about four years okay. and during the war I moved back to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. I worked at Connaught Hospital for about two three years okay. and then uh, had an offer to do a preceptorship in Detroit, Michigan, Penn State University. That's like in the US. Uh, it's a type of program where you just go and observe what they do and see where your knowledge ends. We actually get into um, to be if, if you are interested in ophthalmology, okay. they expose you so that you can get attracted to the different different areas. By the time you leave, you probably will say, "I'm inter interested in ophthalmology, or I want to go further." So I left there and moved to Kenya. <clears throat> I was in Kenya for about two years, but during the uh, some political upheaval there in 1993 to 1994. I found it necessary to move on to the United Kingdom. Okay, I moved to okay. United Kingdom and uh, trained there as an ophthalmologist. And I've been in United Kingdom for about 27 years with wow. my children. I studied other aspects of medicine while I was training in ophthalmology. Wow, that's, that's a very long journey. So um, um, you have a very exciting journey um, and I'd like us to, to talk a little bit about um, your philosophy about life because that's very much important um, to know for viewers to actually understand what's, what's your philosophy about life. Uh, that's not a very common question people ask. Right. But uh, it's quite interesting that you're asking me that. Uh, my philosophy about life is there is a God were created by God and uh, I believe whatever we do on earth in our life it comes back to us. Yeah, it has a ripple Ret effect. Retributive justice. Wow. I also believe in just, uh, justice. Okay. That you must do the right thing all the time. Yeah. You know, don't harm anybody. That's those are part of the principles of medicine as well. Believe in justice, don't do harm to anybody and be fair to people. Right. Yes. So that's a very good one. Um, well, um, Dr. Dayami, from research, um, we found out that um, a lot of Africans, um, when they go out to study, it's a problem for us to have them back. So would you want to throw light on the area of brain drain in our continent? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, first, let's look at why do people even want to advance their studies? Curiosity. For example, I studied medicine and uh, I should have stayed there, just finished medical school and say, okay, that's it, I'm a, a doctor in general medicine and just practice. But you have to accept that once you do something, sometimes there is a tendency you want to pursue it further. Right. So that curiosity to improve your knowledge further gives you the drive to look for other opportunities in your life 
that maybe uh, yes I want to become an ophthalmologist I want to become an ENT specialist I ear nose and throat ear nose and throat or I want to be a dentist or I want to be a surgeon or I want to be a neurosurgeon those type of things so first is your own drive to pursue whatever you have learned to pursue it further and if those opportunities are not in your country then obviously you want to search for those opportunities elsewhere. elsewhere so that's why people go abroad to study okay yeah and even when you go abroad to study you also faced with a lot of problems abroad because you are going into a a country where you probably don't even understand what you're going to be met with there, you know, and you don't know the expectations there of the program there with respect to your own previous training, you know. So um, I'd like to pose you there, Doc. Um, so is it that um, the opportunities uh, that are not readily available in our continent is what is actually driving? them away or it is something that they, everybody wants Guinea pasture? Yes, that's, that's a good question. First, the, the first drive is drive of your career. You've been driven to advance your career and you don't have opportunities at home. That's a typical example why people go abroad. Another one, why people, another reason why people go abroad is because probably they have already trained, they've come home and uh, they don't have job opportunities at home, they will go back. Or if they are working here, and uh, you know, in Africa, the whole of, the whole of sub Saharan Africa, there is immense poverty. So yeah. when you are paid and your salary is not able to meet up with your daily expectations of your life to take care of your family obviously then there is a what we call economic drain, brain drain yeah you live in Africa for economic reasons you know because you your job is not able to take care of you and your family so you go okay so now there was a report I read about the UN um, about um, um, ophthalmology in our continent um, it is it is quite scary so would you want to throw light on the, um, the state of ophthalmology in our continent and um, what systems should we put in place to be able to attract those professionals who have actually gone abroad to bring them back to our continent because like you said we're suffering from brain drain specifically Sierra Leone so what's your take on that? Well ophthalmology according to the WHO uh, standard or stipulation if you call it that way, uh, we should have at least one ophthalmologist per 50,000 uh, to 100,000 population. On that standard, actually on the basis of that, we are very, very, very understaffed in ophthalmology in the whole of Africa. In UK alone, we have over 3,000 ophthalmologists. Wow. Yes. And UK is a lot smaller than the whole of Africa. Yeah. African, the continent, in the continent, Africa, by billion. we have about 1.2 to 1.3 billion people. Yeah. But I don't think we have up to 3,000 3, ophthalmologists in Africa, probably not even 1,000, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, so, in South Africa, we have so many ophthalmologists there because there are a lot of medical schools in South Africa. So, so w what systems um, um, do we have to put in place? As, as, as a continent, we need to attract those who have actually gone abroad to study, who are professionals. So, in your own view, what systems should we put in place to be able to attract professionals who had gone abroad to study who'd want to come back to serve? Uh, First of all, we need to have opportunities for training. And we need to have clear objectives that when these people are trained, we can absorb them and we can pay them equivalent to the basic international standard. Perfect. You see? Yeah. So if you train somebody, and you employ them, but they are not able to even take care of their family, 
then it's going to cause a strain on their life yeah, yeah. and they probably will lose the incentive to even carry on that career as they wanted to do it right you know so then they look for opportunities elsewhere that's natural phenomenon people will always look for opportunities elsewhere so if we establish a very good training based system where somebody is trained and they have been absorbed without any problems then it becomes very smooth and they are paid then that will probably motivate them to stay in Africa like, um, right, I like that. Um, if you want to attract professionals, you create opportunities for them. So I'd like to um, pause you there um, real quick. Um, let's go for a short commercial break. Um, stay with me. We'll be right back. So welcome back viewers, I still have with me Dr. Mohamed Lamidarami, an ophthalmologist who has been practicing in the UK. So welcome back, sir. Well, thank you. Um, so I'd like us to dive in deep now into the field of ophthalmology. Take us through what ophthalmology is really about and um, the problems we have regarding such a, a field in Sierra Leone. Uh, an ophthalmologist is someone who has studied medicine completed medical school uh, depending on which country you attend probably after a level it's about six to eight seven to eight years to finish medical school and then uh, you practice probably for you do your internship after your internship some countries about one or two years then you decide which area you want to specialize in it could be ophthalmology which is a study of diseases of the eye you know yeah so in as much as ophthalmology actually focuses on the diseases of the eye and how it's been treated and all the rest of it so would you want to take us through the general perspective about our health system in Sierra Leone uh, since I was born before independence Wow, <laughs> that's a long time. I remember when I was a little boy growing up in Kono, Gandon, we had a dispensary. So there was a dispenser, I think we had a dresser. So if you like you have a wound, you go to the dispensary, the dresser dresses you. Yeah. The dispenser sees you and prescribes whatever you're supposed to have. And I think those days we didn't have many doctors, but if you go back into history when we got independence our population was probably one to two million one to two million okay. now we have about seven million people yeah and i am not sure as to whether when we had independence we had this vision that the population was going to grow so much right and uh, when i was growing up in Sierra Leone, i think every district headquarter mm -hmm. had a hospital and in that hospital you find probably a surgeon general surgeon you find obstetrician and gynecologist you find somebody who does ears nose and truth uh, i don't know if we have trained enough people to match the population we increase. have yeah you yeah. know i think there is inadequacy there we don't have enough trained professionals you know and uh, even where we have trained professionals we probably don't have enough specialists to deal with the complicated cases now we get so on the the number of professionals is quite low to match the population so, we have because the population ma is. because many a time you see when we have issues of that nature people are to be sent out of the country probably to Ghana or to UK or let's say India so it, it tells you that we're actually suffering from that even in our healthcare system so what what ways in which we can put in order to solve these problems or improve 
our healthcare system because, like you mentioned, there are a lot of challenges. But as an expert who has been practicing in the UK for too long, what, what solutions do you have or do you think might solve our problem? Uh, let's look at it from this perspective. Right. I grew up here. I was born here. I've, I can remember over the years when I come on holiday, holidays, I ask, do you know this person? This was probably one of my classmates. I'll ask another classmate, is this person around? They will say, oh, that man is dead. Is this person around? That man is dead. That brings to my mind life expectancy in Africa. The whole of Africa is very low. Yeah, yeah. I think in Sierra Leone it's between 42 to maybe 45. So if I'm in Sierra Leone living here, I'll probably live in, be living on borrowed times. <laughs> I could die any time. So what's happening here, I think we don't have adequate medical personnel to deal with ailments of adults. For example, hypertension, diabetes, because with increase in the consumption of food products from the Western world, yeah. they use sugar to preserve some of them. So we are taking too much sugar into our system, yeah, sure. which we are not coping with. So there is increase in the incidence of diabetes. And there are not enough researches done in Africa to even find out the prevalent illnesses that we have in our communities. Right. So because we don't even know what's killing people, we don't know, even know how to treat them. Yeah, the solutions will not come forth. Yes. Yeah. You know, so we lack specialists in almost all areas. And without this specialist training, we cannot prolong life. So most adults, when they get these adult-related ailments in Africa, for example, cancer, very bad high blood pressure would lead into stroke. We don't have the medical knowledge and uh, the equipment to deal with this kind of problems. Yeah. So as a result, mm -hmm. life solutions to be limited is yeah. low. Yeah. And then uh, I don't think we have enough investment in the healthcare system in most of sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And because we are not investing much in them, we don't have the equipment to handle some of these illnesses. We don't have the manpower to deal with them. So consequently, these people have to be flown to other countries in Europe or other African countries to be treated. And that's very sad because as a medic, I believe when you have an ailment like a stroke, your life is actually in the hands of the very first doctor that you see. Yeah. So if your first doctor that you see cannot handle your case, then time is running against you to be taken flown from here to oh, probably America or Europe and you probably will have problem with visa regulations and all those things so it's really and sometimes difficult. it's even a problem for people or families to be able to raise money for people to travel overseas because uh, flying someone from Sierra Leone to other parts of the world, it's expensive. So if the facilities are not there, sometimes people lose their lives because of that. Yes, that is true. Uh, the only way to combat some of these problems is for us to look at our own medical system, analyze these problems that we are having, look at how we can solve it locally, because if we continue sending people abroad, it's going to be costly and it's going to even interfere with other services in the country because that is going to be very costly for the government. So it, we are not going to be able to handle it in the long run right. as population increases. So we need to find ways to see how we can locally train people, invest more in the healthcare, so that when we train them, as we said earlier on, we have opportunities for them at home, and they don't have to go abroad to look for a job. They will come back, they will stay home and treat their, uh, their, our people. Another thing we can probably do also, there are a lot of trained Africans abroad 
we have to we need to look at how we can bring them back home encourage them to come back home so if they come on holidays like i've been here we must have programs where we call them we talk to them to be able to uh, tap to into discuss their skills with them. Yeah. yes so we have these opportunities here are you prepared to come back and help us if they are prepared then we have programs where they can be absorbed in if they don't have a house you, we help to accommodate them yeah, housing if they don't have transportation all, yeah. well. there must be explicit programs yeah. around these areas to so attract so that, them yes. and keep them as yes. well i think uh, th th that has been a very insightful um, conversation doc um so um what we're running out of time so i'd like us to move a bit faster so what advice would you give to young uh, medical practitioners who would want to go into different fields specifically let's say ophthalmology or surgery any other part what's your advice to young doctors in sierra leone uh, first of all, we have a very good medical school in Sierra Leone. Uh, most of the young people who graduate from our medical school, when they go abroad, they can train. But I think, if you ask me specifically, going abroad to train and come back, there are a lot of implications around that. For example, if you chose to go abroad, you probably don't know how long you're going to stay there with your studies. If I look at myself, reflect on what I went through in England. When I went to England, I thought I'll be there for just about three years, finish and come back home. That was not the case, you know. So first of all, you have problem with registering as a doctor there. So your degree must be recognized in England first of all as a doctor luckily i trained in africa by the time i went i realized i, I had already found out that my degree would be accepted in uk okay. for limited registration so it took me time to get my registration and even when you get your registration you have to go through the rigors of training there yeah. and sometimes opportunities are given to the local graduates yeah. before the foreigners before the foreigners yeah. so if you're going to probably do your training for three years, when you go to UK or America, it's probably going to take you double that time. And by the time you finish, if you have kids, no, people don't think about all this. You know, like when I was going, I had two little kids. I took them to UK and uh, I had the impression that when I get ready to come back home, I'll just tell my yeah, kids, so it's time for me to go back home, yeah. let's go back home. But that's not the case as well. Oh, really? Because your kids, let's say they grew up in, my kids grew up in the UK. They don't know anything in Africa, you know, and they grew up as British. And when I started talking to my kids about coming back home, I remember one day I came from work, my daughter, she had been pondering over this idea of going back to Africa. Oh, okay. Yes. And this day I came from work and my daughter said, can I tell you something? I said, yes. You know when you said you're going back to Africa? I said, yes, I'm not going. Is that okay with you? <laughs> that was sobering, yeah, <laughs> if I can yeah, say. Yeah, you yeah. know, I thought about it for long and then I realized she was right. Yeah, to make her own decisions. Yes, you know. So you face with that problem. And sometimes, surprisingly also, even when you're well trained abroad, you want to come back home. You try, say, okay, I want to come back home. I want to find ways that I can be absorbed. But as we mentioned earlier, yeah. we don't have a scheme where we can, where in foreign uh, graduates, our own nationals who probably have trained abroad come, we don't have a scheme to absorb them. So you find yourself going from one office to the other, Looking asking for, for ways that you can be absorbed. Uh, it's a difficult terrain to go through because sometimes the person you're meeting probably either they don't know how to help you or probably they are worried about their own jobs yeah, yeah that right. you're probably going to take their jobs yeah, of them yeah. so there is that difficulty 
so people have to be educated also in Sierra Leone as to how to accept their own brothers and sisters who are trained abroad. Yeah. So when they come, you give them a help. You find a way, you know. Salaries, there may be problem with salaries because somebody well-trained physician or ophthalmologist in UK will probably be getting not less than 5,000 pounds a month. And in Sri Leone, that's life not possible, yeah. Yes, uh, but cost of living is slightly higher here as well, probably, yes. So you need more money, you know, to be able to take care of your family. Yeah, so, so yeah, so Doc, finally, before um, we come to the end of the program, um, I want to ask, um, if you were given the opportunity to serve, um, are you thinking of coming back home permanently to serve? Um, because um, it is important for professionals like, like you who have gone to the um, western part of the world to acquire skills and trainings. Would you want to serve your country if you are given the opportunity? Obviously, yes. Okay. But uh, I have to tell you, I'm over 60. And in Sri Leone, I think when you're over 60, you're not employable. <laughs> <laughs> So if my country needs me, yes, I'm willing to come and uh, train young doctors, doctors yeah. and also probably train specialists, you know, because I've been in ophthalmology for nearly 30 years, wow. you know, and I'm willing to do that. I think there are a lot of professionals abroad I've spoken to who are also willing to come back home. Wow. A lot of my friends are willing to come back home if there are opportunities for them. I'm not sure they are expecting the type of salary they are getting abroad, but if a scheme can be organized where people come in and uh, they are giving probably stipend, let's start off with bringing people in to work as specialists on holidays, let's say you come and spend six weeks and during that six weeks you have probably a car available you have an accommodation i'm not sure most of the doctors would ask for too much too much for yeah. that six weeks and we can start off that way yeah and yeah. if they come they spend some time they are interested they can tell their own colleagues abroad this program is there you can be absorbed in it and uh, with time, the government can also provide other, you know, opportunities for them or other facilities that will encourage them to come home. Okay, so so doc, um, so real quick, uh, one of the, the the opportunities our platform provide is to be able to network young professionals with people like you who have actually gained exposure and trainings and all the rest of it. Um, would you consider um, mentoring young doctors, let's say um, five, ten, or even more, would you consider mentoring them directly? Because that's one of the, the, the opportunities we want this platform to provide, to be able to connect professionals who had gone abroad, who had um, got a lot of exposure, a lot of experience and training with young ones who are aspiring to be in their profession. Would you? Mentoring. I don't know how we can organize mentoring on mentoring on a very big scale. It's going to be difficult to just say I'm coming to mentor. So it's a goodwill gesture. Like you're trained, you decide I want to come back home and help people. Because of the distance, there is going to be a problem. But uh, I have been involved in some. I remember two or three years ago, I was introduced to a young man, I don't want to call his name, uh, who was finishing medical school. And uh, I told him about myself, and I think he was having problems with doing his electives. And I advised him, you better do your elective. This is a program you do when you finish in medical school. You choose a, an area, a discipline, where you, in which you want to specialize. So if you have, 
you write to medical schools around the world and they will come they will write to you back they have their own standard their own requirements if you fulfill the requirements they will invite you to come maybe for six weeks you work with them see yeah. how the program go, is going on i think i spons sponsored somebody uh, in kenya they traveled from Sierra Leone to kenya for about six weeks and they came back i think they worked in the area of renal uh, disease kidney problems okay you know uh, nephrology we call it study of kidneys okay and he came back the person is special uh, he had a call he's graduated he's now doing his uh, housemanship i think there's another one i have to also go to ghana kolibu for his uh, uh, elective um, I thank you so much, Dr. Dawami, for so much insights you've um, given us on the show today. So, um, as a medical teacher um, with so much experience, what advice generally would you want to give her? First of all, thank you for having me. Yes. And it's a uh, as we discussed, uh, we know we don't have adequate manpower to run sure. right. some of the specialties that we've discussed. I think my first recommendation would be we should by now have a postgraduate training program in Sierra Leone in all the areas. <clears throat> if we have these programs, people don't necessarily have to travel abroad. Yeah. Uh, we can do Zoom in where we can invite professionals to talk to young doctors here yeah? and through Zoom in they can learn basic skills, even skill transfer program can be organized on Zoom in or Skype. Because the world is moving towards yes, that now. So. Yes, so people don't really have to travel. So yeah. it's not going to be very costly to do programs like those uh, distant learning through Zoom in or Skype. So if we have programs like uh, postgraduate programs where we have, we train ophthalmologists, that can probably take up to three to four years, like the program I went on in Kenya, which for three years you have a Master of Medicine in Ophthalmology. And I think they have programs in surgery, programs in general medicine, and programs in obstetrics and gynecology. So we can have our own local graduates trained here and we can bring the trainers yeah, from it, abroad. Because again. it will enhance the, 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 the health sector in Sierra Leone if we have a postgraduate program. Yes. And it's cost effective. Yeah. But we should bear in mind that we have to absorb them because that's another problem. Yeah. You train somebody, if you are not able to absorb them within the system or pay them well, then there will be brain drain. They will leave the country and go to other countries for better opportunities. So we must have our own postgraduate program and we must put more money into healthcare yeah. delivery system Investment to pay these doctors. Key. Yes. And train doctors, train nurses, you know. And it's better. Most people will prefer staying at home. Because sometimes most times when you go abroad, you are not familiar with the lifestyle there yeah. you probably not cultural even differences. familiar with the cold the cultural differences and you open a whole a can of worms for yourself because your kids will find a way that they are not used to that system you are not used to that system you know and probably the locals also probably don't like you with all these prejudices around the world africans must try to train their own special special uh, specialists in africa and stay in africa wow so that has been so much insightful i thank you so much again dr Dalami. well um viewers this is where we draw down the curtains for today's first edition of the program is professionals with me ibkb we Till we meet again next week, I thank you so much.